Okay, so welcome back to this last face to face session of this uh, pedagogy for effective engineering education uh, workshop and while the slides are just being uploaded, uh, let me just quickly uh, summarize that this has not been a content workshop, it has been more about how to teach rather than what to teach and hopefully you have found this to be useful and um, I think we are now ready to what we will do in this session is we will uh, quickly look at a summary of what all we did since it has been since uh, almost uh, two and a half weeks since we started. So we will quickly recap many of the things that we have seen and maybe have short interactions on those and then go to a Q&A session at the end of the summary. The specific goals of the session, why are we doing this session is that is that as participants what you all need to do is recollect what you did in the workshop, the various concepts you learned, how to apply them, uh, where you will apply them and so on and reflect on all these activities, when to use which activity, for what purpose to use a tool and so on. And from our side as instructors, uh, we would like to synthesize the key concepts and connect these concepts, the learning of these concepts with practice into real life situations. There are two other goals which are put in smaller font that we would like to remind you of what is left in the workshop. There is still one more week and we would like to provide you with some more activities for the next week. So just to give you an overview of what all you did in the workshop, this table here summarizes all the three phases the first synchronous phase where you had separate sessions on learning objectives, Bloom's taxonomy, assessment and so on. You had labs on peer instruction, you had assignments. Similarly, there were sessions on day two on concept map, you worked on interactive visualizations, you worked on rubrics. We will upload these slides on Moodle so that this particular slide gives you a snapshot of what you did during the entire workshop. The takeaways for you at this phase were one lesson plan and we, I think you also uh, you attempted, you also uh, participated in two surveys. In the online phase, there, was a, there were a lot of wiki based tasks and Moodle based assignments which we summarized on in the first day of the synchronous second phase which, which happened this past Monday. And for the past three days, two days and today, you have been refining the assignments, making them more usable for your own classes. You have been giving each other reviews. So we did a lot of peer assessment using the rubrics that we had created so that these tasks will become useful for you when you actually do your own courses. And you finally tried to collate all of this work, the best work and the best assignments you created to put it into your own course portfolio. So that is something you worked on in the lab yesterday. And this morning we looked briefly at going towards doing research in ET. And our approach to doing all of this was this picture that we kept showing a lot in the initial few days and I believe this came up only once uh, recently that if we look at teaching learning through technology which is where all of this is sitting in. We have three pillars or three vertices. There are the learning objectives, there are the assessment strategies and the instructional or the teaching learning strategies. So if you recall what you did in the first three synchronous days, we actually worked a lot on individual level attainment of each of these pillars and then you started working on assignments that connected one to the other. So let us actually start with the main, the very first point that we started with and I am going to pose a polling question at this point. Okay. So this polling question is about learning objectives and it is more of a question regarding your opinion. So which of the following do you agree with regarding learning objectives? Should you start lesson planning and course planning with learning objectives? Or do you agree with the statement that learning objectives are for teachers planning only so I should not share them with students? 
or should you target only higher order learning objectives or any two or more of the above. So there are three choices. Do you agree with any one specifically or any two or more of the above? So for this particular poll, uh, why don't you send your answers through chat? Okay, so it looks like most of you are saying that choice one is something you would agree with. And there is still about maybe 10 or 15 percent of RCs which are claiming that two or more of the above are valid. So let us actually go through each of these choices one by one. So please stop sending your responses. Let us just go through each of these and see under what conditions are these are valid. Are they valid at all? And if they are valid, why we should consider them to be uh, valid statements and so on. So if you look at start lesson planning and course planning with learning objectives, I think most of you have agreed with it. And this is something that we started with in this workshop itself. The very first sessions were on learning objectives. We discussed why learning objectives. That is to avoid the mismatch between students' efforts and teachers' expectations. And we also talked a lot about how to do lesson planning and course planning using learning objectives. Now, if we look at the second choice, it seems to come out of the first choice that learning objectives are for teachers planning. That part is okay. But if you look at why learning objectives, if you recall the discussion from day one, the main reason why, one of the main reasons in addition to course planning, why we should use learning objectives was to make sure that students know upfront what our expectations are as a teacher and that will also help them prepare for exams, it will help the set their expectations and so on. So our recommendation here is that learning objectives should be shared upfront with the students. This is what all the literature on learning objectives say. It can help a teacher decide which instructional strategies and which tools to use in class. It can help a teacher set the exam questions, but it very much helps the students set their expectations and decide how much effort they'll put in, how they need to put in for learning those. If you again recall the sessions on Bloom's taxonomies and hierarchy of cognitive levels, you may remember that there were several levels, six levels of cognitive tasks what we called as a lower and a higher order levels. And what we really said there, we did not say target only higher order learning objectives. What we actually said there was target an appropriate, a judicious blend of higher and lower order learning objectives as appropriate to the topic. Do not stop at lower order objectives alone. In fact, if you target some of the higher order objectives, many of the lower objectives are subsumed within them. But when you do your, when you set your question papers or when you decide what really you want your students to be able to do, think from the perspective of the topic and the content and what really is relevant for learning of that particular, that concept. And then make sure that you have an appropriate blend of all levels of learning objectives. So if you recall how we did, how we targeted the objectives and how we brought in the assessment strategies, you may remember this word alignment that we used often. That there are these three points and in fact eventually all of them need to be aligned. But let us look at one or two examples of alignment of the learning objective and the assessment strategy, especially with regard to this higher and lower order assessment questions and the higher and order, uh, lower order uh, learning objectives. So let us just do a couple of quick polls which should serve as a recall to how to do this alignment and whether this alignment happens or not. Uh, we can actually do this on poll. I will pose this question, read the question and then use the AVU poll to answer the question. So there is a learning objective, students should be up able to apply Ohm's law in simple series circuits and there is an assessment question that the teacher decides to give. Is this objective aligned with the assessment question. I am going to open the poll in a second. So read the question and then I will start the polling. Okay, it looks like about 120 of you have answered. Without actually going into the discussion right now, I would like to put this question back here. 
So what we will do in this particular question is do a full peer instruction. Instead, I'd like you to discuss with your neighbor whether what they think, whether they think the two are aligned or not aligned. And in fact, what if you're not very familiar with the domain, what you can concentrate on are the action verbs. So here it says students should be able to apply Ohm's law. So it's some particular equation or a law that students should be able to apply in simple circuits. And the assessment question given is for students to design a circuit which will serve all these constraints, reduce its fan uh, speed by 40% and so on. So here in fact they have to design a real life circuit for a particular set of specifications and constraints. So think about the purpose of each of the objective and the question, concentrate on the action verbs, get talking to your neighbors and I'm going to restart the poll in 30 seconds. Okay, let's go back to this question quickly and wrap it up. So for those of you who are in the domain, you'll see this immediately, but if you're not in the domain, pay attention to the action verbs. The learning objective, the first statement here is at, is at an apply level. And it's not just this word apply that gives you the hint, it also says that the student should be able to apply in simple series circuits. So this word simple should also give you some indication that this is where they will use a law and apply it to solve a problem, a straightforward problem. On the other hand, the question here is closer to a create level question because firstly students have to design a circuit. The moment they have to design a circuit, there is more than simple application of Ohm's law. And it's not simply designing any circuit, but there are constraints and specifications, very precise constraints are given what is to be done in order to design the circuit. So this is at a much higher level than the learning objective. So these two are actually not aligned. If anything, this is exactly the type of problem which will create problems that we saw on day one. The learning objective talks about straightforward applications and the assessment question which the teacher might have given in the test is about a real life creation and design of a circuit. This is where a student will say that the question was out of scope or we never practice such questions and so on. If your goal as a teacher is to give questions of this nature, your learning objectives should be that students should design circuits for real life applications and you should do a lot, lot of such questions as practice in the instructional strategies and in the classroom and homework. Let's look at one more question. Again, it's a different scenario, but it asks about uh, whether the assessment question is aligned with the learning objective. So read the two and then I'll start the polling. Pay attention to the action verbs. I'll put back the slide. Okay, so let's discuss this question again. See, even if you think you're not from the domain, there are clues in the way a question and a learning objective are written. Regardless of which science or engineering field you're from, you will be able to understand this word calculate. So the in the learning objective, the students are expected to calculate some quantity from experimental observations. So there is some application, some equation or some law that needs to be used, some numbers from the observations have to be put into the equation or law and some calculation has to be done. So this is the expectation, this is the objective. On the other hand, the assessment question which has been given is to state the law, including the mathematical statement, which means state the law including the equation. Stating the law is at a recall level. Stating a law is no more than a, at a recall level. So this is, the kind, this is a reverse mismatch compared to what you saw in the previous example. And a mismatch of this kind is also not desirable. Perhaps students might be able to solve this question and get marks in the exam, but the moment they have to solve a real life problem, they won't be able to do it even though the objective has been written for that level. And that's because they never solved any assess assessment question that relates to that objective. So the main points here 
are that your assessment question and your learning objective have to be aligned and we have a good basis to align them. We have the entire uh, Bloom's taxonomy and its six levels. Whether the learning objective is at a higher level than the question or whether the objective is at a lower level than the question. Neither of these situations is desirable for you as a teacher and for students learning. So to summarize what happened with learning objectives, in addition to the three points that we mentioned earlier, that start your planning with learning objectives, share them with your students, and target both higher and order, or lower order learning objectives. The fourth main point is that align your assessment questions and the learning objectives. In fact, there were several assignments that you had to do based on these two, uh, these two obje objectives from our side. And there were about, there were over 3,000 people who submitted these assignments. So we hope that you did get an idea there. And if you feel you're not clear about when is it aligned or when is it not aligned, go back and revisit the assignments that you had to do on Moodle. Okay, so let's move on now to the instructional strategies. And you may recall that we did a large number of active learning strategies and activities here during the workshop, during the synchronous phases. And we'd like you to think a little bit about what happened in your remote center when you were doing the activities and choose which of these three options fits you best. If it's more than one, you can just say all of them. So send this answer via chat. We just want to say if, see if any one of these is more valid for you than others or if all of them are equally valid for you. So raise your hands within your center, tell your RC coordinator which of these you agree with most or whether you think you agree with all of them. And RC coordinators, please let us know via chat what is happening. So unlike the alignment question, there is no single right answer here. This is more about your opinion. Okay, let me summarize what is happening to these three opinions from the various centers. So from your perspective as participants, it looks like a large number of you think that PI and TPS activities done during the sessions require you to think and refine your understanding. Some of you say that the collaborative activities kept you alert and there are a few who do say that it was difficult for you to do the discussions initially since you were not used to it, but it became easier. So now if you change your role to that of a teacher, who wants to implement these strategies, you will find that even your students fall into similar categories. In the beginning, it might be difficult for your students to do discussions. And you may see that there is not much discussioning hap discussion happening in your classes. You may see that students might have a certain amount of resistance. But if you do go on, if you explain to them what are, what are the reasons you are using these active learning strategies, what are the benefits they might get from it and so on. It will definitely become easier for students as time goes on. They should of course see the benefits which means these questions should be at a level where their purpose becomes apparent to the students. You will also see that the collaborative activities will keep a larger fraction of your students alert, not just the students who sit in the front, but a larger number of students will be alert and will, you will see them participating. So do give them all feedback. So to summarize some points about the instructional strategies, do include active learning strategies in your own classrooms, in your instruction. And very quickly, what we mean by active learning strategies are those activities where students go beyond listening, watching you and taking notes. Make them talk to each other, make them draw diagrams in their notebooks, make them vote, any of the several strategies that we discussed in the last few weeks. Explain the benefits to students, let them get used to it, gradually ramp up. And let the strategy, now we are connecting the strategy to the objectives, let some of the strategies be aligned even to higher order learning objectives. So if you use the strategies mainly for recall or understand, you will see that the strategy is not serving its purpose as much. So include all kinds of learning objectives, including the higher order ones, when you frame your questions. In fact, many, most of you have worked on these questions that you can use in your own classes. 
and when we come to the part about summarizing wikis, we'll discuss them. We also talked about how to choose a specific teaching learning strategy. And one of the main guidelines we discussed was again similar alignment that the teaching learning strategy you use should be aligned to the learning objective. And what align means here, here there is no Bloom's taxonomy or a similar uh, framework. Align here means look at the purpose behind the learning objective, look at what the teacher really wants to achieve and see what are the features of the strategies and based on the features of the strategies, choose a strategy whose features can actually help achieve the learning objective. So let us do a poll activity here to try to understand this sort of alignment. This is there on poll, so I am going to pose the question first, read it and then I will start the poll. Okay, so let us, if you go to the AVU poll, it says which strategy will you recommend? Okay, let us go back to the actual question and try to understand the teachers, the co your colleagues objective here. So the question says that your colleague wants her students to be able to analyze the efficiency of different sorting algorithms for a given context. So before you recommend a strategy to your colleague, it is a good idea to ask her a little more for a few more details about what, how much she wants her students to be able to do. For example, is it that she wants her students to simply pick a particular sorting algorithm or does she want her students to be able to do a pros cons analysis of different algorithms for the same context? What is the nature of these real life contexts? And your answer might actually depend based on her responses to what exactly she wants her students to be able to do. So let us go through each of these strategies and see when it might be useful and to what extent it might be useful. Uh, in terms of the poll, about a large number of you were split equally between think pair share and either PI or TPS. So I think there was about 50 and 50 in choices 3 and 4 and about 10 of you thought that lecture on the topic with real life examples and demos would be a good strategy. Now the lecture on the topic with real life demos will in fact give the information needed for students to be able to say what are the features of the different sorting algorithms. What the lecture may not be able to achieve is students solving a problem, a similar problem on their own, a new problem. Because in the lecture, again it depends what is done in the lecture, but if in the lecture the teacher goes over pro, pros and cons of different algorithms for different purposes, then students may not know how to apply them given a new problem. So this is something we have been seeing throughout the workshop that if you want to, if you want students to apply a law or a principle to a real life situation, you need to give them practice to actually apply it. And peer instruction and TPS might provide this kind of practice. Those of you who chose TPS, it seems that TPS would be useful if you actually want them to, what you can do here is in the think phase, have students individually choose one of the sorting algorithms. In the pair phase, you can have two neighbors discuss what are the pros and cons of their own chosen algorithm for the given context. And in the share phase, as an entire class, you can do an analysis of the various algorithms. That is one way to implement the TPS for this particular activity. On the other hand, if you choose to do a peer instruction, you can actually do something very similar. You can give choices as to which algorithm might perform better and in the discussion phase, bring out the pros and cons of the various algorithms. So in terms of actually writing questions, there were several assignments where you wrote PI and TPS questions and here we have some latest statistics. Total number of submissions for TPS assignments was 3000 and close to 2000 for PI submissions. What you and we are doing now is to collate these and organize this into the wiki so that a community resource can be built where you can use each other's questions. Think of it as a huge question bank and you can use each other's questions in your own instruction. In terms of assessment strategies, which was the third node, we through the previous two questions and previous two uh, discussions just now, we 
did talk a lot about how to align. So, the main points here are that the assessment strategy and the assessment question you pick should be aligned to the learning objectives as well as to the instructional strategies. One of the things that you may not have been familiar with before the workshop for classroom use is how to use self and peer assessment. So, for certain assignments you can consider using rubrics creating your own rubrics and asking students to do a quick self or peer assessment in order to get feedback on their own work. And this is a point that came up this morning that you can use student feedback to improve your own practice. Maybe some topic needs to be explained further, maybe more examples need to be given somewhere else and so on. Again, there were you were asked to write look at your own question papers and see what were the levels of Bloom's questions in them. And we are happy to see that over 2000 of you actually attempted this. This is an exercise that you can attempt in your regular courses when you create your question paper. In fact, keep a guideline as to how many questions you want for, from each category of Bloom's level. And once you create your question paper, do a quick check, see how many questions you have from recall and understand, how many from apply and analyze and so on. If you find that you have too many or too few in any category, you can revise your question paper. So, let us come to technology use now. And again here is an opinion question, when you decide to use technology in your classroom, which of these do you think should be the first step? Should you check how familiar students are with the technology? Should you match the purpose of the activity to the feature of the technology or directly give assignments using the technology? Maybe the answer is more than one of the above. So, let us see what you want to, which of these you want to choose as your first answer. Okay, so let us just summarize this particular question and then we will talk a little bit more about how to integrate the technology. So, when you decide to use a new technology, I think most of you are saying that you have to do one and two together. Both these are important, clearly three is not the first thing that you would do when you decide to use technology. From the instructional perspective, you have to make sure that you choose a technology tool which matches the purpose of the activity. But at the same time to make sure that the students, you, you have to make sure that the students are familiar with the technology tool and if they are not, give them exercises where they will become familiar. So, if you do one and two in a systematic manner, then the assignments that you give using the technology will be more effective. So, to summarize the learnings from the technology. Give students time for practice, start slowly. So, this is all about finding out how familiar your students are with the technology and getting them to be familiar. In fact, if you reflect on this workshop, you may not have been familiar with some technologies like wiki. The initial assignments you had to do were mainly to get yourselves familiar with the features of wiki. And once you got familiar, then we looked at the purpose of using that particular technology which was wiki and the purpose in our case for this workshop was creation of community resources and collaboration. And when we chose wiki for that purpose, it was by seeing which technology tool has this feature of being able to effectively create a community resource. So, as teachers in your own classrooms, these are the two points, the first two are about the students and the other two are about choosing the tool. So, let me hand over the mic to Jay Krishnan, he will talk a little bit more about integration of technology and the immersion of technology. So, just now you answered a peer instruction question about technology, where you said that it would be a good idea to see whether the students are familiar with technology and then match the purpose of uh, activity with the feature of the technology. So, if you look at the overall uh, format of the workshop, you can see that, so assuming we have this particular triangle of teaching, effective teaching learning and the three modules of learning objectives, 
teaching learning strategies and assessment strategies. You can see that technology, so technology is actually in embedded into the entire content and we have actually immersed you in the technology. So, let us two new technologies that we wanted you to learn. One was about using videos or screencasts which might be useful for you for flip classroom activities or even your regular classroom activities. Another was uh, visualizations and yet another was wikis. These three technologies had three different purposes. So, let us look at visualization. Visualization will help you uh, explain concepts in the class which otherwise would not be visible or uh, there are some movements which are uh, there is a trajectory. So, there were several purposes for which in the which is there in the content which would have made visualization more useful. So, we had shown some examples and then helped you understand how to use these visualizations. Next take the case of flip classroom or uh, use of videos or screencasts. So, throughout this workshop you would have been using videos and doing activities associated with the videos, which is the very same way that we recommend a flip classroom activity should be. That means, with the out of class segment you should attach activities at lower cognitive levels, so that students will watch the uh, videos or the screencast and make the screencast pretty small. So, if you happen to look at most of the videos that we gave you, they were between the range 3 to 10 minutes. So, uh, there were never higher uh, videos and if there were larger recordings, we had split it and asked you to pause at a particular point, then do some activity and then continue watching the video. So, it is important that you get familiarized with this, you get immersed in this. So, even this AVU within our AVU sessions, which you feel, uh, you feel as a video telecast to your center, every of our session are mixed with activities. All the blue slides that you see are activities where we, which we have strategically placed when we, uh, when we uh, which we have identified that there are a lot of information transfer happening and now we should do some activity. That is how the activities were also mixed along with the content. So, this is something we wanted you to learn uh, through this workshop, which was not very explicit, but I am making it explicit right now. And regarding wikis, you would have identified some of the difficulties that your student, so non-native, uh, digital native student, so somebody who has no experience of wiki before, would have faced when you have actually gone and done wiki activities. So, this is something, so there are possibilities of making mistakes. So, for example, you give from one important learning that we, I as a instructor got when I gave you the wiki activity is the instructions on joining the wiki may not be familiar, familiar to all of you. So, sign in to the wiki for you means clicking on sign in. It does not mean that you have to create a new account. So, this is something new for me. So, similarly you would have experienced a lot of difficulties while you were doing wiki activity as a learner. So, make sure that all these are getting converted when you give wiki activities to your students. So, the particular assignment on wiki activities for students is going to be posted tomorrow in Moodle and this is your post workshop activity or post workshop assignment. So, there are centers asking for examples of PI questions. For these centers, I would refer you to the wiki that we had created. So, all centers have posted PI questions. If you want domain based PI questions, there are specific domain pages where you can find users. So, go to the user and find the PI questions or TPS questions that they have created. That is very specific reason why we have these activities or very specific activity of creating content in the wiki. So, what you see is that you first get immersed in the technology and then you start planning to use the technology. So, this is what we have done throughout this workshop. 
and also community resources, assessment strategies. You have a question paper created by all the participants. So, individually you have created question paper for your own course. So, all this has been uploaded as part of course portfolio assignment. It will have its own learning objectives and active learning strategy of either PI or TPS has been uploaded in the uh, wiki for trial, where uh, you will see all the participants in this T10KD workshop posting their uh, resources. So, there is one more wiki, ET repository wiki. Uh, currently, we have given access only to the remote center coordinators. We, uh, in the coming week, we will extend this to all the participants moderated by the remote center coordinators, so that you can take benefit of all the workshop resources that were originally created in uh, some of the previous workshops that our uh, research scholars or our instructors conducted either through a view or in face to face mode. So, people who are talking about problems in uh, wiki, just look at the wiki statistics that I just took out from the wiki page. So, there are around 2958 users registered in the wiki, that wiki for trial and 19501 pages have been created by all of us. So, it is not just me, it is all of you, all of you who have contributed to this big number. We had the maximum wiki activity uh, during the past two days. So, uh, the statistic that I got from wiki spaces is. 71,823 views of wiki pages and there were 5,587 edits alone on January 19th. Most of these would have been simultaneous edits because we had a wiki lab with in which all of you were accessing it together. Now, another 47,067 views were there yesterday with 4694 edits. That means, you are actually going and editing some page. Now, this might be one reason that wiki would have crashed, it's mailed the wiki spaces people that we had faced this problem when these many numbers actually accessed wiki yesterday and I hope I will get some response from them in the coming days. So, that is why we have made the second phase of wiki activity completely in asynchronous mode, so that different people, so the, this will be distributed, there will not be these many simultaneous edits on the wiki. So, just for the wiki activities alone, we will give you an extended uh, time. Some of the activities are very immediate, that is in the post workshop activity by Jan 31st, you have to complete two of the key wiki activities, that is course portfolio and uh, reviewing of peer instruction assignments. So, the peer instruction assignment will be open to all tomorrow, so that wiki spaces do not crash again. So, let us look at our approach to the format of workshop, uh, which had both active learning and uh, collaboration. Collaboration is inherent in active learning. So, within SRC sessions, we had lots of activities polls, think pair shares, debates, chats during each session and also we had specifically asked find a partner, group together, do some activity. So, these are ways in which we have actually used active learning and collaboration in uh, SRC sessions. In the lab, you were creating course materials for your own course. So, it was not for anybody else that you were doing the activity, it was for yourself. And we had done peer review of these activities, of the crucial activities, so such that you will get a feedback. So, it is essential that you do some sort of peer assessment with the help of rubrics, even to your students. Give peer assessment strategies, activities to the students also, so that they will learn from each other. And most importantly, experience before actual practice. So, what I just told you a few minutes before. Recall what you did for flip classroom, PI or TPS and wikis. 
so uh, SRC is synchronous remote center, so each of you are synchronous remote centers for us. So the AVU session is the SRC session, so it is another acronym that we have developed. So important things that you have to learn is that interaction and collaboration is important for a 21st century learner, that means today's students are more interacting and are more collaborative and hence as a 21st century teacher you have to interact and collaborate, give avenues for interaction and collaboration to students and you yourself have to interact and collaborate with the students. So these are some of the ways in which we have tried to interact with you, uh, the think pair shares, the summaries that we gave, the chat the interactive Q and A or the floor transfer that we did at uh, regular intervals, every day we had done some floor transfer and also we have, we will be doing the same interaction and collaboration through wikis and Moodle forums in the coming days too. So these resources that we created, the Moodle or the wiki, they will always be there and hence that is also a venue for you and us to collaborate and interact. So finally, we had a session where we discussed how you can move from an ET practitioner towards an ET researcher. What next? As an ET practitioner, you have to complete the assignments. So if you look at, you look in your Moodle, you will see the assignments posted. Again the certification criteria with regards to assignments still hold good, all assignments in this phase have to be completed. In addition as an ET researcher, just have a look at the refine your ET study homework that we have given. There is a mission 2014 discussion forum created in Moodle and if you are not able to do it, at least try to come for T4E 2015 which will be at Warangal as a participant, see what is happening what research is happening in educational technology in India and how different teachers are trying to do innovative practices in their classrooms. So there will be feedback surveys posted in Moodle which you have to complete because we need your feedback to improve ourselves and in case of any doubt you can just in case of any clarifications and if you need further inputs on any of the workshop topics, you can always mail us at resinityworkshop.iitb at gmail.com. So this is a common mail ID that our workshop admin team always maintain and do look at regularly. Okay, I think we have time for a few questions. So what we'll do is we'll give some preference to people who, who had raised their hands earlier and if you still have a question. We might do that. Uh, if you have any question, do uh, raise your virtual hand and we will try to go through one by one. RC1200, IES College of Technology. As we know, there is a matter of teaching. As a teacher, we cover around 70% of the paper in the class and then we will left for the student for self study. Uh, my, my question is that by using this education technology, how much labor should be covered in the classroom or how much should be left for a student to better? So the question from IES college is uh, how, how much portion to teach in classroom and how much portion to teach in outside classroom. So uh, once again let me repeat it, so for these kind of questions where how much or which technology is important or how much you should do with a particular technology, there are no clear answers. So it is up to a teacher to decide what is more important. So look at the learning objectives that you are setting for your students. Give activities which are sufficient to achieve learning objectives either inside classroom and outside classroom. Also keep in mind that the student has only 24 hours in a day to do all these, uh, these activities and there are so many subjects. So 
think about all these while you are planning to do inside classroom and outside classroom mixture uh, for your students. So, RC 1217. Uh, I have two rejected questions. Is that is the danger of a below average student losing interest in the activities of the education technology, uh, particularly if he consistently comes out with wrong answers? And secondly, uh, do you think overuse uh, of using these technologies will lead to disinterest? Has there any study been conducted on this? Okay, so for the first part of it, whether uh, students who are um, what you termed as below average, will they lose interest if they get the answers consistently wrong? What we find is that if the students are singled out in public and you know it, it appears that their answer is consistently wrong, that is when they get demotivated. Whereas the kind of activities that we are talking about of peer instruction and TPS in small groups, they always find that the students are not diffident about exposing their answer to a small group of friends. So usually you will find that you are, they will sit in a group in which they already anyway know what level of understanding the other students have. So this actually helps weaker students rather than hurts them when we do such activities in the class. So the second question was about uh, overuse of educational technologies. Now that's again something that you have to play by uh, by the year in your own classroom. So it's we are not advocating that in every class we should do all these educational technologies nor are we saying that we should stop completely with uh, lecturing in the classroom. So that is something that what you have to as a teacher have to see what works for your class and gradually introduce these technologies. The basic idea here is what we have to keep in mind and the basic idea is that the more the student is actively engaged in the classroom, the more learning is likely to happen as compared to the student simply sitting passively in the classroom and listening to a lecture. That's all. RC 1047. Uh, where the assignments are posted. So this, uh, what, what should I post on board? To get to get to trial. The board, the, whatever the board is given. Yeah. So, uh, what we have done is look into the Moodle forum. We will again repeat the instructions in the Moodle forum. Basically, this is a procedural question that Wikispaces account has been created, but wiki for trial, the access to wiki for trial has not been enabled. So, all you have to do is use the join code to join the wiki. We will give you specific instructions today evening, immediately after this feedback session. A separate post will be made in Moodle, clearly mentioning what you have to do as procedure to join wiki for trial. 1205 Mahatma Gandhi Mission College. Can we use wiki for projects? If yes, then how to use wiki for managing the students projects? Can you guide us step by step procedures for it? Okay, the question is how to use wiki spaces or wikis in general for projects. So till this time, so this is a, uh, and uh, he wanted specific instructions on how to do this particular activity. So till this time you were all learning wiki as a learner and you identified what you can do with it. Now with this particular idea, now the next phase of post workshop activity, you will have videos and specific documents which will help you to create your own wiki and which will help you assign projects within wiki spaces. So clear instructions will come in the following days. In short, how to do this is create your wiki. In your wiki spaces, on to the right hand side, you will see something known as projects. So you can assign students to different projects where you can individually create pages, project pages and make them do activity. So whoever is the key or the teachers or the assessors, make them as organizers and invite all your students as members to the wiki. So the organizer will have a control of what is happening. He will be able to make changes 
whereas the students will just have to do the project specific activities for which instructions have been given either in class or through wiki. So, this is the way in which you have to use wikis for uh, doing projects.